Hey there, welcome back to the podcast of Wednesday's Child. So you have the company of Sarah and Debbie today. Hi, Sarah. Hello. How are you doing? It's a um, Friday. I know, it's Friday. It's Friday and I've got makeup on. So it's clearly, yeah. it's clearly a successful day today. I don't usually do the whole makeup on a Friday, but yeah, so it's going to be a good day. It's Friday the equivalent. It's like, what do they call it? Dress down Dress Friday. down Friday. Yeah. Dress down yeah. Can't be asked to put makeup on. Can't be asked to put makeup on, can't be asked to brush my hair, and I'm going to slob around in my leggings all day. But I've got a dress on and makeup, so it's clearly, it was for you in our audience, Debbie. I'm, I'm truly honoured. <laughs> says, says her just sat here in her jeans because she knows her <laughs> out for me since today, but there we go. Okay, um, okay so today's topic, we're going to, we, it's something we've discussed a little bit on Wednesday's Child over the last few weeks, but not got into in any great detail, but we're just going to talk about cost living. And the how do the cost of living crisis sits for people going through eating disorder recovery or quite entrenched in their eating disorder and what um, the change in the economic situation for households across the country might mean for people in that situation. And I sense that there will be a few people listening to this going, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, noticing it already. And then there'll be others that think, mm, well, maybe not really, because, you know, my illness doesn't really feel like it's affected by that. So I thought... We'll just explore it um, together and see how you and I can reflect on our own experiences and on people that we befriend and support and just try and give some, as we always say, our kind of toolkit tips and advice for wading you through, wading your way through what will be um, a challenging time for sure for anybody, but particularly for anyone that's got mental health issues to contend with along the way. So let's let kind of start on on like let's look at this kind of broader picture we're facing cost of living crisis and everybody out there is talking about the stuff that they're seeing going up in price it's the cost of energy so it's going to cost more to heat our homes this winter we know that cost of food i've seen it i'm sure you've seen it you know just like the household shop there's a few pennies here and you know what your grandmother used to say save the pennies it saves the pounds whatever you know, there are little incremental price increases all the way along. And all of that was before we got the latest shift that we did from the beloved government that has made people feel under even more of a cost around things like rent and mortgage payments. So there are certainly huge pressures on people in any kind of spectrum of life now, whether you are somebody just about to start living, at, living as a university student on your own or you're somebody who's an adult with three or four children under your roof and either you or the person you care for has an eating disorder. So it's going to affect everybody. Sarah, like when you think about that, what does it what does it throw up for you in terms of people that you um, currently befriend and support or in terms of looking back at how if you'd have faced this current economic situation in the middle of your eating disorder, can you reflect on how this might have affected you and your household? Yeah, I mean, blimey, where to start, I suppose. I think the first thing I would like to bring up is how this potentially could increase isolation. So we have people who we talk to a lot, don't we, who are on, you know, in, in this whole spectrum of eating disorders, you know, not, not just one particular type or one particular diagnosis, but the whole spectrum of eating disorders. Many, a common thread is that kind of periodic parts of isolation where you are purposefully drawing yourself away from the world in order to keep yourself safe and secure in your own your pooliness and and I think that what this would have done for me was would have meant that leaving the house and anything such as that would have been seen as a treat and I think that word's one that we should explore today the word treat um how you know even just getting the bus into town if I was having to think about the pennies a bit more it would have been a great excuse not to get the bus into town well I can't afford that bus trip so I better stay put um, and I that's that's a place I fear is that and obviously with, with an eating disorder comes all elements of social anxiety so it just allows almost like it fuels that ability to keep yourself isolated perhaps what we know is when we allow that soundtrack of the eating disorder to have a a point and a purpose it eats away at us even more doesn't it it becomes the dominant noise yeah we can't yeah. hear everything else we can't hear the friends phoning us and saying would you like to meet in a cafe in town all we can hear is the 
noisy the eating disorder saying well you see this is even more reason because everything's more costly there's any more, even more reason why you should stay at home and why you shouldn't do this and why you shouldn't agree to go out so yeah, yeah absolutely and you said there, like meeting your friends for a coffee in town there's another potential thing we might see as a treat so when I was trying to get over my feast eating phase or my binge eating phase of my recovery when I was just eat 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 I purposely made myself go out to certain cafes so that then it was almost like it was a fire break of being in the house around the food that I'd been hoarding so I would go to, and I would always go to the same cafe. I know we're going to talk about brands in a moment, but I always got the same cafe because it was my quote unquote safe cafe. But again, that was really important part of that part of my recovery. It made me get out the house. It made me get away from the food I was hoarding and it made me eat socially. And anyone who's listened to this will, will know all about my social eating and my crazy ways in which I had to break some horrible, horrible things I was saying, my illness was saying to my, myself in my own head when I used to go out eating. But again, if you're thinking about the pennies and thinking about things going up, it is likely that those trips out with your friends to have those really important social eating experiments could be one of the first things that goes. Yeah, I, and I think you're right. And I think a lot of what we see with people that develop eating disorders, often for a long time, even afterwards, after recovery, one of the things that sticks around, even if it's not related to the food per se, is the issue with what should I could I spend on myself is a slight sort of obsessive compulsive concern about food and spend um about food spending of any on anything so you know do I deserve to buy that new lipstick do I deserve to change my shampoo can I afford to replace these shoes of where the soles are coming off you know just stupid stuff that I I look back on and say that the money became such an angst for me and I can see that then you know that intertwined with well, then can you spend that additional money on something as frivolous as food, which is a treat? <laughs> it, it becomes even harder to justify the yeah. very things that we need for our recovery. I mean, I'm living through that exact, exact thing now and, and I'm about to actually have, have to have quite a challenging conversation with my own dad because um, I'm refusing to buy a car. My car's 15, 16 years old. One of the doors doesn't work. The window's always open. It's constantly breaking down. And I travel for work. It's a danger for me to be in that car. Now, I can't afford it at the moment because of cost of living. But up until this point, when I've been reflecting as to why I'm still driving this rust bucket, it's because I absolutely refuse to believe that I deserve a decent car. And it's like that. So I'm living that right this very minute. So we, 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 when, when we're talking about these things, Debbie, I think it's really important for people to understand that we sometimes can, can be quite lighthearted about it because I think we need to be but actually we are always coming from a position of knowing exactly where folks have been from or living through yeah. things like that already and and you're dead right that that having to find the strength and the the belief that you do deserve to buy stuff and then especially like you said there food is not something that you deserve food is something that you have to have and we got a really interesting letter in the mailbag didn't we about someone talking about in this cost of living crisis um how how can they possibly see food as medicine when other people are going without yeah. and i think the really important thing in that is that for anybody in any element of eating disorder recovery food in some shape or form is medicine and we would pay for our, we pay for our prescriptions in the uk you know if, if you got a prescription you'd go to the pharmacist and you'd, you'd pay your eight pound fifty nine pound twenty whatever it is and that's the equivalent of you getting a couple of meal deals from tesco or whatever you know it it, it, it is for many of us it is medicine and we we have to spend the money it's not about deserving it we have to yeah absolutely and and i think that will become particularly difficult when the median narrative a lot at the moment will be about being really careful not to waste and not to, you know, not to spend too long heating or using your cooker or all those sorts of things. But actually, if heard by somebody with an eating disorder mindset, oh, well, you're basically saying I shouldn't put the oven on every day now because, because you know, that I shouldn't do that. It, it's almost justifying the reasons that the eating disorder is allowed to exist because it's not only expensive to buy that food, it's expensive to cook that food. It's expensive yeah. to consider it the luxury to go in the kitchen and commit to make something for myself. Whereas we have to constantly remind ourselves that a lot of these things that we read in the media are not meant for you right now. You're the, you're the person who needs that medicine more than anybody else. The media aren't thinking about you when they're telling people 
to be cautious about putting their oven on or to eat their oven chips or whatever, you know, it, it or telling people to not throw away food when there are plenty of people starving in the world. I mean, you know, it is so easy for us to get caught up in that kind of, I don't know, it's just, it's that kind of compassion and conscientious kind of yeah. mindset, isn't it, that talks us into thinking that we ought to deprive ourselves and harm ourselves. And if you are in that position where you're you're thinking, right, well, the the conversations on the TV, the advice we're getting from the TV at the moment, isn't it, is that is if it is you are in a real tricky position with your energy prices, is that a microwave and an air fryer is so much cheaper to run than an oven. Mm. So I mean, I've just my air fryer is on its way, actually. <laughs> I ordered it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> as well I come back. So it's on its way. But we've obviously I think most people in this world nowadays in 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 the UK at least, will have a microwave. But I then put a word of caution over that because there are bullshit microwave meals and then there are recovery wholesome microwave meals. So just have a real check. You know, if you've decided rightly so, it might be the right thing for you that actually the oven, having it on to make a roast dinner all Sunday is too much of an expense. But you're, you're going to do everything in your microwave. Brilliant. Perfect. Just check <laughs> that the eating disorder isn't controlling what type of thing you are putting in your microwave, you yeah. know, because that I think also I think this is a an easy, easy way that we can be slipping into. Oh, well, I best buy that smaller thing because it's a bit cheaper. And therefore, it, it you know, when before you know it, your cupboard are full of bullshit food that is not going to help you recover. Exactly. And, you know, there's still like. I mean, what does it take to kind of, you know, boil that kettle and make the porridge pot in the morning or wh whatever yeah, it might be, yeah. you know, that I, I think we just have to kind of caution everybody to say, of course, your eating disorder is going to want to say, hooray, I've got another reason to harm you. I've got another reason that I've got another ally here. I've got another campaigning tactic. It's like PR for making sure that eating disorders continue. You know, I, you, you've got to really just check in with yourself and say, yeah, but is that meant for me you know I always do that I always do the kind of question answer thing of when we're feeling low with an eating disorder behavior it's kind of ask yourself that question that you and I have discussed before about is that true so yeah. you know, oh I'm putting on loads of weight or oh that other person's got more stuff on my plate and I always say ask that question is that true I think in this case it's saying is that right for me and is that what is that the message I should really be hearing I think you know, need to kind of say to yourself that every time, whether it's because you're absorbed in the news or you're debating kind of energy costs and whatever. We, we really do have to think that actually taken to the nth degree, people with an eating disorder can be already very, very physically poorly. If we add into that a cold winter where you then feel the need to deprive yourself of heat and deprive yourself of eating and not be reaching out for the mental health needs and support that you should be getting we could be entering a really really depressing time and also going right back to what you said at the beginning if you remove yourself off the landscape yeah. of socializing which is perhaps one of the most fundamental of all keep socializing and cheaper food is not bad food i think that's a thing we've got to keep reminding ourselves so i mentioned at the beginning of this that i wanted to talk a little bit about that brand need so when i was in certain stages of being pooly there was only certain types of things i would eat so certain brands of bread certain brands of soup certain brands of porridge whatever and lo and behold they were like the fancy pants brands um there is nothing better in this world than the cheapest of cheap white bread toasted with a big old slab of butter on there is nothing better in this world it's the reason oh, why so. oh it's the reason why though when you have a baby anyone out there listening who's had babies that when you've had a baby they bring in the cheapest white bread and toast and it's the best meal you've had in your life and the reason why they bring it is because it's just gorgeous so if you are if you are worried about food shopping because you know that you will spend four pound fifty on a pot of bullshit ice cream then you don't need to spend £4.50 on ice cream. You're buying that ice cream because it's got a certain brand name that is like not actually ice cream. It's just some random chemical. But you can buy a big tub of ice cream in the next yeah, counter. What we're talking about there, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> do you reckon? Do you reckon? Yeah, I, reckon <laughs> I could write it in the message of our chat, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but yeah, but 
just again that's another thing uh, but i i think use this if that is the case if you are stuck with that branding and you have to have a certain type of bread etc then this is the perfect opportunity to create this as your recovery momentum and your recovery challenge you know if you can't afford to buy x brand then go challenge yourself to get that other stuff challenge yourself to make this bigger period of time that actually you're going to embrace the difficulty because recovery is all about embracing difficulty so we're good at that embrace the difficulty and choose something different off the shelf and and actually you know if you are in services at the minute and you're working you know perhaps not day patient but you're working with community service eating disorder team you're working with a nutritionist those are the sort of things right now to be saying to you know, I'm getting everything you're telling me about my meal plan, but I'm really, really worried about costs. Can you help me navigate through what I might pick as an option that comes in at a slightly less price point? Sit down with them and let them do their work. You know, frankly, I am happy for you to email the post bag and say, Debbie, Sarah, this is my weekly budget. You tell me how I get my six meals a day out of this for recovery. And I swear to God, we'll do it. <laughs> because we have both done cheap and we have both done recovery and you know I'm not particularly positive when it comes to food I just know what my body needs if I'm going to keep my brain happy and you know that can very much be yeah kind of cheapy cheap stuff and I'm no no nutritionist but I think recovery is certainly possible at all levels and we just we just have to be careful about what we're allowing our brain to excuse us from and we've gone back into this house and onto a Sunday afternoon batch cooking. So when James and I first got married, and you, when you first get married, you have no money, do you? Because you're straight out of uni and all that stuff. I got married at 23. Debbie, can you believe it? Wow. 23? Anyway, um, yeah, we used to have to batch cook on a Sunday because it's the only way we could afford to eat through the week. So we've just gone back to that. And actually, do you know what? It's quite cool. Amy will join in. Freezers full of like this, but it's a sip stuff, you know, it's chili and it's bolognese, a bolognese sauce, and there's a bit of stew in there, and I think there's a lasagna maybe, um, all parceled up and packed up. But then also that's that grab and go thing. So when you're in a spin and you're in the kitchen and it's a Wednesday night and you're like, Oh my god, I've had a busy day, I don't know what to eat, and I can't afford to buy anything, you you know, it's fine. There are things in the freezer. Open the freezer, bang, off you go. And I'm a granola themed. I love granola. So, and I like to be able to make my own. I love dried fruits and nuts and seeds and all those sorts of things whacked in with some oat, cooked up with some syrup in it and whatever, you know, it's a stodgy old granola, but it's my favorite mix and I like it. And that's the sort of thing that for me, I take quite a lot of pleasure in making that at the weekend enough that I've got a bloody great container full that whether I'm at the house or not at the house and out and about I can portion it up and I can have it in Tupperware and wherever I'm going if I need to or I know there's enough there that will see me through for a week and no I haven't gone to the supermarket and yes of course I've gone and bought the ingredients but actually somehow it feels a bit more like I'm giving myself a bit of self-love and I've enjoyed being in the kitchen and creating that for myself it's part of me saying you deserve to do this it's your therapy you deserve to invest in yourself and I, I think that I suppose that would be the other um other message really from this is that at the very time when we're being told go lean you know preserve energy and don't spend more than you need to all that kind of stuff we also have to say at the point of where you are in an eating disorder recovery investment in oneself is really important and that means investing in yourself financially spiritually and socially and that that is going to cross across you know, across all spectrums People with eating disorders do struggle terribly with kind of maintaining heat. And so if you're sitting in a freezing cold house, refusing to see anybody and refusing to eat, this can only end one way. And that's in, you know, disaster at a point when we know that eating disorder inpatient bed units are ever, ever more stretched. So and you are helping your recovery. And, and you know, um, so these small things, just trying to kind of think about how you can maintain the momentum it is really important. And keeping humour about it as well. You know, yeah. that same wonderful person that put that letter in the mailbag asking this question about cost of living and spoke about food as medicine. They finished it on the end. And I was I was laughing and laughing and laughing out loud with, oh, well, at least when I start putting weight on, I'll be able to turn the heating down because I won't be freezing cold anymore. And I thought, get in, you know, go on, sister. It's like that this is a really challenging period of time for everybody in this country, everybody. And there's nobody that's not being impacted by, by what's happening at the moment, but 
and an eating disorder recovery is incredibly challenging and it's incredibly serious but we also can find joy in life still and just that little comment of that person saying well you know what yeah I'm struggling with with the food at the minute I'll get over that hump I'll put some weight on and then I can turn the heating back off you know it was like kind of I just loved the narrative it was just so sweet yeah absolutely I think it's really important that we just try and because otherwise at the moment life just would feel so oh just so dire so much wouldn't it yeah. especially when you're surrounded by that news dialogue constantly it really does feel like the last few months it hasn't been a lot to sort of shout and sing about and you know I'd love to say well we have got Halloween and Christmas and all those great festivities around the corner but I know some people will want to compromise on those because of exactly what we've just been talking about. And we don't have to just always be spending loads and loads of cash as well like you know people understand and this year out of anything people understand you know we as a family have already had a chat about look Christmas is going to feel a bit different and not just me and James and Amy but like the wider family and um so you you know say to folks you've got a you've got a tongue in your in your head and and go go to your family what have you and say look you know I live by myself or you know we've just moved into a new house or you know we've got a new baby whatever Christmas is going to have to be really frugal but it doesn't mean that we can't be together because we can still get together we can still have a lovely time we can get the games out of the loft we can watch the Christmas movie we can get all cozy in front of the fire um, but it's just there might not be as many presents to open this year and okay. that's fine. It's a time if you're caring for somebody with eating disorder, you know, actually now's the time to have those kind of conversations and say, what, you know, what's, what's your gift look like to you? And, you know, for me, at the time when I needed to recover from my eating disorder, well, there was only one gift that I needed, and that was a life without an eating disorder. Whether I was prepared to commit to it or not, it was what I needed. And I remember the Christmas not long after I'd come out of an eating disorder unit, and I, I was adamant I just didn't want stuff and things. I was still kind of wading my way through recovery but I just wanted anybody I saw over that period just to perhaps be a bit more mindful about how they talked about me now that I was kind of restoring weight but actually fundamentally to be doing kind of you know whether they were physical or just theoretical gifts that were focused on just helping me be recovered in the next year and I had people that gave me like IOUs about taking me out for lunch or taking me out for dinner or taking me to like a London theatre show when I was well enough to do it um, and then I had other friends who knew I really liked um, particular food that they were great at cooking. So, you know, like kind of one friend just amazing at cheese straws. And I developed a bit of a thing for cheese straws. <laughs> which, you know, it's huge, great box cheese straws. Um, and, you know, somebody else just had invited me around for her family's. Um, they always do a kind of family Sunday dinner the week before Christmas. And I went around and kind of participated in that and was doing cracker pulling with another person's family and and that for me was way more of an important gift than opening 10,000 small yeah. items of you know Marks and Spencer's knickers on the day <laughs> my uh, one of my it was what wasn't the Christmas I came out of services it was the Christmas of like when I'd so it must have been 2019 when I'd started like my real year real recovery and my best mate got me um she made me a little pack of date night tokens oh. and bear in mind at this point I'd been in an inpatient for seven months I'd been in day service all the time you know I was not dates were not happening in this household and she got and it was like there was I think there was 10 in there so over the course of that next year it just gave James and I an excuse to you know she would come and just sit with Amy and the dogs that was all it was um but we we went to the cinema and we went, I think, you know, we went to the pub. We didn't ever do anything fancy, but that was such a thoughtful gift, yeah. you know, to, to help me reconnect with my husband, but also remind myself of the person that I can be and could be and wanted to be again, knowing that my little girl and dogs were safe at home with my best friend. Oh, that's amazing. There are cheap options to do of all of these things, aren't they? Even if it's kind of, you know, I, I don't know, sort of wearing your North Face jackets and going other um, winter. All the brands are available. <laughs> but, you know, snuggling up, hand in hand, going for a walk and taking some kind of flask and picnic. And, you know, whether you ending up sitting in a car, having it with a rug over you or whatever, then fine, do it that way rather than going to a Ponty restaurant. It'll probably mean more and be more memorable. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and yeah. the big message, I think, in all of this is you've got to keep eating. <laughs> and that is you know I know that everything in your head screams at you saying that that's silly no we don't need to but if you're in eating disorder recovery you just have to keep eating and it just everything elevates from that you know how you feel about yourself how your brain fires 
how you're able to go about your relationships, your working life, your education life, and just the mood and momentum with which you have to continue that recovery. So it is it's kind of an upward trajectory when you start to restore and and recover. Yeah. So I hope that's helped. It's in a way it's kind of quite a bleak topic, but hopefully a timely one for us to talk about ahead of the winter period and as we sit in the midst of all that's going on politically. Uh, obviously, just like our other um, mailbox contributor did, please feel free to send your um, stories in of how you're getting on and let us ask your p- p- specific, um, you know, look at your specific questions and, and cases. And also kind of, as we say, we're very happy to give you new aids for your toolbox or suggestions for how you might go about things or just tell you the way that we did it, which we're never saying is word perfect. You know, we know we stumbled and got some stuff wrong, but, you know, we got there in the end. So, OK, if you want to get in touch, once again, the email address is hello at wednesdayschild.co.uk. As ever, do please follow us on social media. You'll see we've got lots of different things happening right now, some collaborations we're doing with other organisations and some really interesting contract work we're doing. So get in touch, tell us what you're thinking, tell us how you're feeling about your own recovery and really be part of the conversation. Thanks again. And we will join you soon for another episode of the Wednesday's Child podcast. Take care for now.